and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The angel of the, of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and death be brought to the his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I am here to talk about Our Lady. Uh, Father told me to give a presentation on Mary, and he left me to figure out what that meant. So um, I wanted to do something... Um, a little unique uh, because, I mean, you can go on YouTube and find out all kinds of things about Our Lady. So what I wanted to do tonight is to talk about Our Lady's um, role in my life, her, her intercession in my own life, and my experience of, of her intercession. And then the second part of my talk will be about her role in our times. Um, and so the second part will be kind of like an argument that I will be making about what kind of role she plays in our times. Um, so the first part, her role in my life, will correspond to one of her titles, um, which we pray in the litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is the refuge of sinners. And then the second part will be the Queen of Prophets. So these are both titles for Our Lady, which we pray in the litany of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And for me and my life, she has been the refuge of sinners. And I think in our times, in the age we live, she is the Queen of Prophets. So, oh, I got big legs on here. Um, okay, so first, Mary's role in my life. Our Lady has played a huge role in my life, um, and she is the reason why I am here today as a deacon, and I'm studying to be a priest. Um, and the story of how she interceded in my life uh, really begins when I was about 25, um, which was seven years ago. I'm now 32. And... Before I was 25, so from the time when I was in college up until um, 24, 25, I was living a very selfish lifestyle. I had, um, during college, I had stopped going to Mass. I had stopped living my faith. And um, this is true, even though I grew up in a very strong Catholic family, uh, we would go to Mass every Sunday. We'd never miss Mass on Sundays. It wasn't even... We never thought about missing Mass on Sundays. Um, we prayed the rosary together a lot as a family. Um, faith was very important to us when I was growing up. Um, so I have no excuses whatsoever for the fact that I abandoned the faith when I was in college. Um, I, I, you know, I hung out with the wrong people, um, and the people I, I hung around with didn't practice the faith, and... Um, I, just, I just abandoned the faith, and I forgot about God, and I forgot about what I believe in, and I gave myself to the world, basically. Um, and throughout this time, I did nothing good for other people. It was all just about myself. So I worked at a chemical company um, after college for about five years, 
and you know I worked and then other than that I did whatever I wanted to do to try to have fun I was just trying to have fun in my early 20s and that was my life it was completely selfish and self-centered um, and looking back I'm not proud of it at all but it is what it is um, and, and God is so merciful um, during this time, like especially looking back, I can see it now, how lost I was. I had no direction in my life. I had no idea of what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I, was, I worked for a chemical company, even though I had no interest in chemistry. Um, I wasn't very good at it, but that's what I was doing every day. I worked in a, in a chemical lab. Um, I had no interest in pursuing a career in chemistry. Um, and I just, I lacked direction in my life. And it was, um, when I was 25, I met a girl named Rebecca. And Rebecca was awesome for me. She was, she was really like a gift from God to me because she was just so perfect. She was Catholic. She was studying to be a doctor. She was, she was about to graduate and become a doctor, which I thought was really cool. She was humble. She was just like a, a really humble person. And best of all, I knew that she liked me. She actually liked me. And I knew that if I wanted to, I could marry her. It was, it was completely clear to me. But the problem was, for some reason, my heart just wasn't there. It wasn't into it. It, I couldn't get myself to love her and commit myself to her. And so um, it, was, it was kind of scary for me because I knew that I would never find a better girl for me than Rebecca. It, I knew it was not possible. I could not find a, a girl better than her. And so I was thinking, like, if I can't give myself to her, then what woman can I give myself to? So it made no sense to me. And... It was after this, after my relationship with Rebecca ended, um, I moved into an apartment by myself, away from my friends from college, which um, was, was good for me. And for some reason, I picked up a book off my shelf, uh, which had been sitting there for a long time, and it's this right here. This is To the Priests, Our Lady's Beloved Sons. This is a book of messages from Our Lady to an Italian priest named Father Gobi. And these messages are, are beautiful, and they're, I just know they're Our Lady's words. Um, and my grandpa gave me this book a long time ago when I was you know, really young, and I never opened the book. I never just didn't care. And finally, for some reason, when I, when I moved in by myself, I decided to pick up this book, and I started reading it. And Our Lady, through this book, started speaking to me and this is when she really came into my life um, and she just she just changed my life from that actually I wanted to read a short passage I was looking through this yesterday this is from October 18th 1975 I have chosen you my son for this simple reason because you are the poorest the smallest and the most limited Humanly speaking, you are the most destitute. I have chosen you because in your past life, my adversary had almost succeeded in claiming a victory. In your life, I have, I have had you live as if by anticipation, the experience of what I myself will do at the moment of my great triumph. My adversary will one day think that he is celebrating, celebrating a complete victory over the world, over the church and over souls. It will only be then that I will intervene. So um, Our Lady, through these messages, really spoke to me, and she entered my life. And the best way I can describe it is I just fell in love with Our Lady. I just fell in love with her, and I knew that I wanted to give my life completely to her. And before that time, like I said, I was like without direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And then she came into my life, and it, I just knew I wanted to give myself to her. And I, I think I, I like to look at it as like I was like a, a person on a boat in the middle of the ocean at night, just completely lost at sea. And then 
I saw a star in the sky. And even though I was still on the boat in the middle of the ocean, I knew if, if I could just keep focused on that star, which was Mary, she would lead me in the right direction. And she was my star. And so I just focused on her and I, and I just gave my life to her. Even though I didn't really understand it, um, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just loved her and I wanted to give my life to her. The, the priesthood hadn't entered my mind whatsoever at this point. Um, so I was going through this conversion with Our Lady at my side. She was, she was carrying me. And one thing she did for me was she helped me to receive the grace of true faith. So up until that point, I, I think I always believed in what the church teaches. I never really doubted it. I never really questioned it. But up to this point, I didn't really know. But now, all of a sudden, I knew that what the church teaches is true. I knew it. And that was, that was a big, important change for me, knowing that what the church teaches is true. And Our Lady helped me to start living my faith. Um, I started going to, to church on Sundays. Um, and then pretty soon I was going to church, going to Mass um, after work, after work throughout the week. Um, I started going to Eucharistic adoration a lot, um, frequent confession. Um, I needed frequent confession because I had developed a lot of uh, bad habits through uh, over the years. Um, ad, uh, rosary, you know, everything that helps us to stay close to Jesus, I began to do. And Our Lady started to help me to detach myself from, from all the things that I had grown attached to over the years. So she just really changed my life. Um, and her, at this time, early on especially, her presence was so tangible to me. Like I could close my eyes and I could just feel her holding my soul. Like I could just, it was so tangible. I could just feel her presence. Um, and this whole, this whole experience of Our Lady's intercession in my life is just, she is the refuge of sinners. And I was the worst kind of sinner because I was, was raised in the faith. You know, I had every reason to be a strong Catholic and I abandoned God. I abandoned the faith no excuses. I was the worst kind of sinner. And Our Lady rescued me. She was my refuge. And I wanted to give my life completely to her. And I didn't know it at what this meant at this time, but I knew that she was my mission. This was my mission. She was my purpose. And so as this was going on, gradually the desire grew in me to become a priest. And eventually it got to the point where I knew that, that that's what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a priest. But I had no clue about the seminary. I knew that there was such a thing as a seminary, but I didn't know how you get in. Um, I didn't know if they would even let me in. Uh, I, I just knew nothing. And this whole time, I was keeping this all to myself. I, I didn't talk to anyone about my desire to become a priest. So it was just me and Our Lady. Um, and so I just started praying to her every day that she would let me be a priest. Um, however that was going to happen, I just started praying that. Um, and I prayed that for, um, I don't know, six months or so. And then finally, uh, one day I was at work and I decided to pick up the phone and call the priest at the parish where I'd been going. Um, didn't really know him, but I picked up the phone without really planning on doing it. And I said, Father, I want to be a priest. And then uh, he said, okay, come meet with me. And then within like three months, I was down at St. Minard in the seminary. <laughs> yeah, it was very fast that summer. Um, and since that time, th this was five years ago, since that time, really my mission or my, my understanding of myself and what I'm doing, um, my vocation has not changed. I'm going to be a priest, but I still see my role and my mission as to give my life entirely to Our Lady. Um, and, and that hasn't changed, and I hope it never changes. Um, so overall, my point is, for this whole first part, is that 
I am going to be a priest, not because I am holy, but because God is so merciful. God is so merciful, and he helped me to find his mercy through Our Lady. It was through her intercession that I found his mercy and that he, he allowed me to, um, to become a priest. And it's just all his mercy. So that's the first part. Um, before I go to my second part, Queen of Prophets, um, I want to talk just a couple minutes about some uh, important devotion or aspects of Marian devotion in my life. Um, so St. Dominic, about, I don't know, 800 years ago or something like that, 700 years ago, he said that through the scapular and through the rosary, one day Our Lady would save the world. Our Lady would save the world one day through the scapular and through the rosary. Um, Raise your hand if you know about the brown scapular. Okay, so the brown scapular, Our Lady appeared to St. Simon Stock in 1251, and she um, was holding her scapular, which is this right here. It was like a bigger one, um, but she was holding the scapular, and she told him that whoever dies wearing her brown scapular would not suffer eternal fire. And this promise was later um, approved by the Pope, um, and it's, it's true to this day. Whoever dies wearing Our Lady's scapular will not suffer eternal fire. But the scapular is more than just something that saves us from hell. Wearing the scapular is a sign of, of belonging to Mary. It is a sign of entrusting yourself to, to her as a child entrusts itself to his mother. And it, it's a sign of love for Mary. Um, it's also a sign of obedience to Our Lady because she, has, she wants us to wear her scapular. And so out of obedience, we wear her scapular. And um, one time when I was uh, still living at home with my parents, I remember seeing my little brother been uh, riding his bike with his friends out um, in front of our house and it was in the summertime and they all had their shirts off and I saw my brother Ben he had his shirt off but he had his scapular on and I, I felt in that moment what I think something of what I think our lady feels when she sees us wearing her scapular it was like I just knew that that my brother Ben is in good hands he's in the hands of our lady and she has she's protecting him and it was just, just this good feeling. Um, but our scapular is an important gift, and we should see it as important because it is a special gift from Our Lady to us. So th- we have the scapular. That's really important to me. And then uh, also is our, the rosary. The rosary is an important part of devotion to Our Lady. And praying the rosary helps us to meditate on the life of Jesus and Mary by going through the mysteries and and meditating on the mysteries. And it also um, is more than just about meditation. It's about just being, putting ourselves in the presence of Our Lady when we pray the rosary. It helps us to to just be with her and and draw closer to to her through the rosary. And it's, it's a way for us to offer just a little something out of love for Jesus and Mary. And um, I think it's also important to pray the rosary together with other people whenever possible. This is not always possible, but it, it's so powerful when we pray together with our families, um, together in the church, when we pray the rosary out loud together. Um, this is, it's very powerful. So um, one other thing I wanted, wanted to show you guys This is my favorite image of Our Lady, and it's a little obscure. I'm going to pass it around. Um, It comes from a little prayer book called the Pieta Prayer Book, and it was drawn by an Italian mystic, and it says that she drew it as a result of a spiritual experience that aided her in the details of this portrait. And I just, I've loved this image of Our Lady, and I feel like I know that this is pretty close. (laughs) Um, and I just, I, sometimes I show it to people and they're like, they don't really get it. Like, (laughs) but to me, it's, it's, she's just so beautiful. Um, and early on in my, my conversion, I would spend just 
sometimes my whole holy hour just looking at this image of Our Lady. Uh, so it's been really important in my life. I'm going to pass it around in case you guys want to look at it. So what does true devotion, what does consecration to Our Lady do for us? Our Lady, I think, I know, she wants us to be humble and she wants us to be little in our own eyes. She wants us to be little and humble like children. And she wants us to be simple. She wants us to be detached from the things of this world. And she wants us to be devoted to prayer and to serving others, to putting others before ourselves. And most of all, she wants us to be like her son, Jesus. And she wants to lead us to her son, Jesus. Um, she wants us to, to love him, to imitate him, and to, um, to devote our lives to him, especially in the Most Holy Eucharist. So the more we give ourselves to Our Lady, the more she can form her son Jesus in us, the more we can be like her son Jesus, and the more, more humble and more simple and more generous and selfless we can be by giving ourselves to Our Lady. So that, that's the first part of my talk. I don't know how long I just went, um, but we're at least halfway done. Um, so the second part I've, I'm kind of excited to talk about because this is something I've been thinking about for a while that I never really have had a chance to, to talk about, but now I have a reason to. Um, our Lady's role in, in our own times. So I found this book in the rectory. Do you, is this yours, Father? Okay. Um, it's called The World of Marian Apparitions, and it's got... Um, pictures and information from all kinds of places where Our Lady has appeared, uh, especially over the last 100 years. Um, and I found a graph. So this graph right here, it shows th um, the frequency of Our Lady's apparitions in the last 100 years. And this graph basically goes like this. So basically Our Lady has been appearing more and more throughout the world over the last 100 years. And so the question is, why? Why is Our Lady appearing more and more throughout the world? Um, I think that some people, um, including Catholics, will, they tend to kind of dismiss Marian apparitions or um, even dispute them, dispute their authentic authenticity. And... I think one of the biggest reasons for this is that they simply do not understand why she's appearing. They don't understand the bigger picture of why Our Lady is appearing throughout the world. Um, and if they did understand this bigger picture, um, and if they understood Our Lady's apparitions within the bigger context of salvation history and, and even sacred scripture, they would uh, be more inclined to pay attention to Our Lady's apparitions. Um, so that, this is the argument I want to make, is that if we look at the Bible, especially if we look at two figures, that, um, these are the prophets Elijah and St. John the Baptist. Looking at these figures um, can help us to understand Our Lady's role in our own times. And that's, um, that's what I want to argue in the next few minutes. I think that Our Lady, who is the Queen of Prophets, I think that she is essentially carrying out the same task that Elijah and John the Baptist carried out in their times. And so what was their task? What was the task of Elijah and John the Baptist? In the book of the prophet Malachi, God is talking to Malachi, and he's talking about the prophet Elijah. And he says this about the prophet Elijah. Behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me. I send my messenger to prepare the way before me. So this is essentially the task of Elijah, to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And then in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, Jesus, Jesus uses these same words to describe John the Baptist. He says, 
This is he, referring to John the Baptist, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way before you. And then Jesus even says, if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. So, the task of Elijah and John the Baptist was to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And my argument is that this is the same mission that has been given to Our Lady in our times. It, it is to prepare the way for the Lord, to make, to make straight his, his paths before he comes again. And so if this is true, then there should be some connections in the Bible between Our Lady and between, between Our Lady and Elijah and between Our Lady and John the Baptist. So I just want to point out a few of these connections um, which I've, I've noticed. The first one comes from Revelation 12.6. And this is where it's talking about the woman clothed with the sun. And the church teaches that um, specifically this is referring to Mary. She is the woman clothed with the sun. And that is why Our Lady of Guadalupe has the sun right behind her. She is the woman clothed with the sun. And in Revelation 12.6, it says that she flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which to be nourished. So she flees into the wilderness and she is nourished there. And then if we look at 1 Kings 17, where it talks about Elijah, um, I'll just read this passage real quick. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt by the brook, brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So, in this passage, Elijah is, is told by God to flee into the wilderness, where he will be nourished by ravens and by by the brook. So the first connection is that Our Lady, the, the woman clothed with the sun, and Elijah flee into the wilderness where they are nourished. So I'll just put nourished in the wilderness. Okay, another connection. Um, one thing I've noticed about Father Mike when he prays to Our Lady is that he always talks about her mantle. He always asks Our Lady to wrap her mantle around whoever he's praying for. And this, um, this symbolizes her maternal protection, and it also, um, oh, it also, it also symbolizes the scapular as, as Our Lady's mantle. Our Lady has a mantle, and in the same way, we read in 1 Kings 19.19 19, that Elijah passed by Elisha and cast his mantle upon him. So just like Our Lady has a mantle, so does Elijah. And Elijah casts his mantle upon his disciple Elisha. And, um, and if you read on, Elisha ends up uh, performing some amazing miracles through this mantle which is given by Elijah. So... Both Our Lady and Elijah have a mantle in Scripture. Um, another one is Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Just, just yesterday was the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So where did Elijah live for many years and perform great miracles? Mount Carmel. So this is uh, number three. Both Our Lady and Elijah have a strong connection to Mount Carmel. And then the last connection between Our Lady and um, Elijah, at least that I found, is that um, we know from our, our church, what our church teaches, that Our Lady was assumed into heaven body and soul. That we call this the Assumption of Mary. Uh, at the end of her life, she was taken up into heaven body and soul. And then in 2 Kings 2.9, we read, 
And as they still went on and talked, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So Elijah was assumed into heaven, body and soul, just like Our Lady. So number four, assumption. Okay, now connections between Mary and John the Baptist. And I have uh, four of these as well. Um, Number one is pretty simple. Where did John the Baptist live and preach? In the wilderness. Just like the woman clothed with the sun goes to the wilderness. Number two, John the Baptist had disciples. We read in John 1.35 that John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the, and the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. So John had disciples and he not only had disciples, he leads his disciples, he points them to Jesus. So, so the disciples of John end up becoming disciples of Jesus. And this is exactly like Our Lady. Our Lady has disciples. Anyone who is consecrated to Our Lady is a disciple of Our Lady. But but she always points them to Jesus, just like John the Baptist. She leads them to her son. So here I'll just put disciples. Okay, number three. uh, This is my favorite one. Uh, There's a line in John, John 1, 8. And it says, He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. And it's talking about John the Baptist. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. So one of the church's um, traditional symbols for Our Lady is the moon. And the moon is not a light. It doesn't produce any of, its, of any light by itself. It simply reflects the light of the sun. It bears witness to the light of the sun. And this is exactly what Our Lady does. Our Lady is not her own light. She simply reflects the light of her son. She bears witness to the light of her son. And so this line, he was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light, is, um, it can be perfectly applied to Our Lady. She is not, she is not the light, but she comes to bear witness to the light. And I, I just think it's awesome. Like Sometimes I look at the moon, and I, I realize that God made the moon as like a symbol of Our Lady and, and how awesome that is. And, and the sun is a symbol of Jesus. Um, but I'll put moon for number three. And then last of all, um, it's a simple one. What was the message of John the Baptist? The message was repent. Believe in the gospel. The kingdom of, of God is at hand. And what is the message of Our Lady in, in all these apparitions? Uh, it's, it's simply repent, turn back to God, uh, pray. I mean, that's it. Do penance. Their messages are essentially the same. So I'll put repent. Okay, so this is, um, this is basically my, my argument is that Our Lady is like a new Elijah for our times. And just as John the Baptist was, was the Elijah for his times, um, and he prepared the way for the first coming of Christ, I think Our Lady is like the new Elijah for our times, and she is preparing the way for the second coming of her son. And, um, and I think this is why she has been appearing all over the world. And it makes perfect sense that God would appoint her to do this, because she is the queen of prophets. So... To conclude, I will just read a uh, verse from the book of Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so perhaps this verse through Our Lady is being fulfilled in our own times. Now, if there's any questions, um, feel free to ask comments, whatever. Susie? Mm-hmm. by the 
Yeah, they go through a process. The bishop approves them, and um, also the Vatican will approve them if they're um, deemed authentic. Okay, that's what I wondered, because mm-hmm. you've heard of apparitions, but mm-hmm. they're not necessarily approved. Yeah, that's correct. what I was curious Yep. Okay. Yep. Who can I get a schedule? Um, See Father Mike. See Father Mike. I don't even know Really? Yeah, talk to Father Mike. He can get you one. You got it. Yeah, I'm sure Fran can too. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, but I'm seeing other similarities as the Queen of Prophets. If you added a third column and said your parish priest, your parish priest is in the world, but he's not supposed to live in the world or be of the world. Mm. Parish priest uh, is supposed to make disciples and followers. Mm-hmm. Um, your parish priest hears confession and therefore calls you to repent. Mm. And your parish priest is supposed to be the living embodiment of Christ living among you. He reflects the Son. Mm. I, I think you've got a third column there. It's yeah. Called, it's called Mother of Priests. <laughs> yeah, yeah I like title. that. That's her title. That's a good point. It's interesting, too, on that wilderness piece, because the, the second part of your talk and the first part really go together. You were in the wilderness. Mm. You and, and Our Lady found you. Mm-hmm. And, and as we think about all the different places where Our Lady has appeared, like the, oh, hello. There's a, the, the, like, the word wilderness literally means an abandoned place, and and like Our Lady shows up when something has been abandoned, maybe an aspect of our faith, maybe a, something has been abandoned. There's lost souls, and she shows up there. Mm. It's awesome. Mm. Yep. When's the last time she appeared? <laughs> what? Did I miss something? Yeah, probably today. <laughs> that was just a few hours ago. Uh, <laughs> well, so... There's, um, ap- there's apparitions in Medjugorje. They're still going on. Um, because they're still going on, the church can't um, approve them until they're, until they're complete. Um, and they've been going on for a long time. Um, 41 years. 41 years. It's one of those, pl- we need to all go to Medjugorje together. Let's get on a plane. Let's go. We need to go by Croatia. Mm-hmm. My mom did. It's by Croatia, Bosnia. I think the, um, we, haven't, we haven't developed this yet, but it's, there's a tie between St. John the Baptist and Mary in that she goes to help her cousin Elizabeth and John recognizes Jesus mm-hmm. in her womb. Yeah, and it's, yeah. And, and I think there's a connection there between her mm-hmm. um, beyond Queen of Prophets, that she had something to do with bringing Jesus to John. Mm. Just and mm. there's a similar, and she will bring help us to bring Jesus to other people. Mm. She's the carrier, and we also she's a model for us of carrying Jesus, so that John the Baptist was able to be recognized the first time recognized mm. in the womb and then the second time so yeah. it's just it was through her voice that that um, mm-hmm. he recognized jesus too and in the church we celebrate three birthdays jesus mary and john the baptist um, so yeah this isn't like perfectly put together but it's something to throw out there I just think it's when we know people who have left the church, left the faith, made disasters of their lives, and when we find ourselves in that position, like, there's nothing better to do than to go to Our Lady. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, to me, it's like Our Lady is like the, she's like God's mercy almost as a person. Like, I don't know. Yeah. You know? 
things really get bad, I bet every one of us think of something our mother said years ago. Mm. Oh, Dottie, that's good. Mm -hmm. It is good. I can remember growing up in the 40s and 50s, every bird bath in, for as far as you could see, had a statue of Mary in it. <laughs> Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Even in the even in the Protestant ones, mm -hmm. you know, they had a statue of Mary in their bird bath. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for coming. Let us pray. Thank you. I think we should end by praying a hail Mary for Deacon Jack and his vocation, and entrusting his whole priesthood, his year of diaconate, but also his entire priesthood to Our Lady, that she will wrap her mantle around him and all of the years and that he will be serving our Lord as a priest, which will be forever. Hail Mary. Full, Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.